This is de Gareth's book readings of my two published paper books, written by and read aloud by Prof. Dr. Hugo de Garis. Email profhugodegaris at yahoo.com. Website profhugodegaris.wordpress.com. This is chapter one from my book, The Artelect War. Cosmist versus Terrans. A bitter controversy concerning whether humanity should build godlike, massively intelligent machines. Chapter 1 Introduction. <laughs> Lovely start. My computer's just. Crazy. <sighs> Zipping over pages. My patience, patience. Page 12. <laughs> Chapter 1 Introduction My name is Professor Hugo de Garris. I am the head of a research group which designs and builds artificial brains, a field that I have largely pioneered. But I'm more than just a researcher and scientist. I'm also a social critic with a political and ethical conscience. I'm very worried that in the second half of our new century, the consequences of the kind of work that I do may have such a negative impact upon humanity that I truly fear for the future. You may ask, well, if you're so concerned about the negative impact of your work on humanity, why don't you just stop it and do something else? The truth is, I feel that I'm constructing something that may become rather godlike in future decades, although I probably won't live to see it. The prospect of building godlike creatures fills me with a sense of religious awe that goes to the very depth of my soul and motivates me powerfully to continue despite the possible horrible negative consequences. I feel quite schizophrenic about this. On the one hand, I really want to build these artificial brains and to make them as smart as they can be. I see this as a magnificent goal for humanity to pursue, and I'll be discussing this at length in this book. On the other hand, I'm terrified at how bleak are some of the scenarios that may ensue if brain building becomes too successful, meaning that the artificial brains end up becoming a lot more intelligent than the biological brains we carry around in our skulls. I'll be discussing this too at length in this book. Let me be more specific. As a professional brain building researcher and former theoretical physicist, I feel I'm in a position to see more clearly than most the potential of 21st century technologies to generate massively intelligent machines. By massively intelligent, I mean the creation of artificial brains brains which may end up being smarter than human brains by not just a factor of two or even ten times but by a factor of trillions of trillions of trillions of times that is truly godlike since such since such gargantuan numbers may sound more science fiction like to you than any possible future science the third chapter of this book will explain the basic principles of those 21st century technologies that i believe will allow humanity if it chooses to build these godlike machines I will try to persuade you that it's not just science fiction and that strong reasons exist to compel humanity to believe in these astronomically large numbers. I will present these technologies in as simple and as clear a way as I can so that you do not need to be a rocket scientist, as the Americans say, that is, someone very smart to understand them. The basic ideas can be understood by almost anyone who's prepared to give this study a little effort. The third chapter introduces you 
to all these fabulous 21st century technologies that will permit the building of godlike, massively intelligent machines. Probably a host of ethical, philosophical and political questions will occur to you. The prospect of humanity building these godlike machines raises vast and hugely important questions. The majority of this book is devoted to the discussion of such questions. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I'll do my best. One of the great technological economic trends of our recent history has been that of Moore's Law, which states that the computational capacities, for example, electronic component densities, electronic signal processing speeds, etc., of integrated circuits, or chips, have been doubling every year or two. This trend has remained valid since Gordon Moore, one of the founders of the Intel Microprocessor Manufacturing Company, first formulated it in 1965. If you keep multiplying a number by two many times over, you'll soon end up with a huge number. For example, two times two times two times two dot 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 ten times equals a thousand and twenty-four. If you do it twenty times, you get one million forty-eight thousand five hundred and seventy-six. That is over a million. If you do it thirty times, you get a billion. By 40 times, you get a trillion, etc. Moore's Law has remained valid for the past four decades. I wrote this book in 1998. For the past four decades. So that the size of the Moore doublings recently, recently has become truly massive. I speak of massive Moore doublings. Moore's Law is a consequence of the shrinking of the size of electronic circuits on chips. So the distance that electrons, the elementary particles, whose flow in electronic circuit is what constitutes the electrical current, have to travel between two electronic components, for example two transistors, is reduced. According to Einstein, the fastest speed at which anything can move is the speed of light, about 300,000 kilometers per second. And this is a constant of nature that electronic currents have to respect. If one shortens the distance between two electronic components, then an electronic signal between them, that is, the flow of electrons between them, has less distance to travel, and hence takes less time to traverse that distance at the constant speed of light. A huge effort over the past few decades has been devoted by the chip manufacturing companies into making electronic circuits smaller and hence denser, so that they function faster. The faster a microprocessor chip functions, the more economically attractive it is. If you are the CEO of a chip manufacturing company and your competitor down the road in California's Silicon Valley brings a rival chip onto the market that's 30% faster than yours and six months ahead of you, then your company will probably go out of business. The market share of the rival company will increase significantly because everyone wants a faster computer. Hence, for decades, electronic circuitry has become smaller and thus faster. How much longer can Moore's Law remain valid? If it does so until 2020, then the size of electronic components in mass memory chips will be such that it will be possible to store a single bit of information on a single atom. A bit is a binary digit, a, a zero or a one, that computers use to represent numbers and symbols to perform their calculations. So how many atoms, and hence how many stored bits, are there in a human-sized object? such as an apple? The answer is astonishing. A trillion trillion atoms or bits, that is a one followed by 24 zeros, or a million 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 million. Now you beginning to get an inkling for why I believe that massively intelligent machines could become trillions of trillions of times smarter than we are later this century? Not only is it likely that 21st century technology will be storing a bit of information on a single atom, it will be using a new kind of computing called quantum computing, which is radically different from the garden variety or classical computing that humanity used in the 20th century. The third chapter will attempt to give a brief outline of the principles of quantum computing, since it's likely that technology, that, that technology will form the basis of the computers of the near and longer term future. The essential feature of quantum computing can, however, be mentioned here. It's as follows. If one uses a string of n bits, called a register in computer science, uh, for example, 0010111101111010, 0, 0, 
in some form of computing operation, it doesn't matter for the moment what the operation is, it will take a certain amount of time using classical computing. However, in the same amount of time using quantum computing techniques, one can perform, one can often perform, two to the power n such operations. Two to the power n means two multiplied by two multiplied by two dot 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 n times. As n becomes large, two to the n becomes astronomically large. The potential of quantum computing is thus hugely superior to classical computing. Since Moore's law is likely to take us to the atomic scale, where the laws of physics called quantum mechanics need to be applied, <coughs> humanity will be forced to compute quantum mechanically, hence the enormous theoretical and experimental effort in the past few years to understand and build quantum computers. Quantum computing still has many conceptual and practical problems that need to be solved before quantum computers are sold to the public. But progress is being made every month, so personally I believe that it's only a question of time before we have functional quantum computers. Now, start putting one bit per atom memory storage capacities together with quantum computing, and the combination is truly explosive. 21st century computers could have potential computing capacities truly trillions of trillions of trillions dot 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 of times above those of current classical computing capacities. I hope you have followed me so far. At this point in the argument, you may be racing ahead of me a little and object that I seem to be assuming implicitly that massive memory capacities and astronomical computational capacities are sufficient to generate massively intelligent machines. and that nothing else is needed. I've been accused by some of my colleagues on, on, of this, so let me state my personal opinion on this question. There are people, for example, Sir Roger Penrose of Black Hole Theory fame, an arch-rival of the British cosmologist Stephen Hawking, who claims that there is more to producing an intelligent machine than just massive computational abilities. Penrose claims that consciousness would also be needed and that new physics will be required to understand the nature and creation of artificial consciousness in machines. I'm open to this objection. Perhaps such critics are right. If so, then their objections do not change my basic thesis very much, perhaps causing a delay of several decades as the nature of consciousness is better understood. I feel that it's only a question of time before science understands how nature builds us. That is, I expect science will come to understand the embryogenic process used in building an embryo and then a baby consisting of trillions of cells from a single fertilized egg cell. We have the existence proof of ourselves, who are both intelligent and conscious, that it's possible for nature to assemble molecules in an appropriate way to build us. When a pregnant woman eats, some of the molecules in her food are rearranged and then self-assembled into a large molecular structure consisting of trillions of trillions of atoms that becomes her baby. The baby is a self-assembled collection of molecules that gets built to become a functional, three-dimensional creature that is intelligent and conscious. Nature, that is evolution, has found, found a way to do this, therefore it can be done. If science wants to build an intelligent conscious machine, then one obvious strategy is to copy nature's approach as closely as possible. Sooner or later, science will end up with an artificial life form that functions in the same way as a human being. Common sense says that it would be easier to build an artificial brain if science had a far better knowledge of how our own biological brains work. Unfortunately, contemporary neuroscience's understanding of how our brains work is still painfully inadequate. Despite huge eff efforts of neuroscientists over the past century or more to understand the basic principles of the functioning of the human brain, very little is known at the neuro-microcircuit level as to just how a highly interconnected neural circuit does what it does. Science does not yet have the tools to adequately explore such structures. However, as technology becomes capable of building smaller and smaller devices, moving down from the micrometer level to the nanometer level, that is from a millionth of a meter, the size of bacteria, to a billionth of a meter, the size of molecules, it will become possible to build molecular scale robots that can be used to explore how the brain functions. 
science's knowledge of how the biological brain works is inadequate because the tools we have at our disposal today are inadequate. But with molecular scale tools called nanotech or nanotechnology, neuroscientists will have a powerful new set of techniques with which to explore the brain. Progress in our understanding of how the brain functions should then be rapid. Brain builders like me will then jump on such newly established neuroscientific principles and incorporate them rapidly into our artificial brain architectures. Hopefully in time, so much will become known about our own brain's function that a kind of intelligence theory will arise, which will be able to explain on the basis of neuronal circuitry, a neuron is a brain cell, why Einstein's brain, for example, was so much smarter than most other people's brains. Once such an intelligence theory exists, it may be possible for neuroengineers like myself to take a more engineering approach to brain building. We will not have to remain such slaves to neuroscience. We will be able to take an alternative route to producing intelligent machines, although admittedly initially based on neuroscientific principles. So with the new neuroscientific knowledge that nanotech tools will provide, and the computational miracles that quantum computing and one bit per atom storage will allow, brain builders like me will probably have all the ingredients we need to start building truly intelligent and conscious machines. At this point, a host of questions arises, and I'll spend most of this book trying to answer a lot of them. Let's jump into the future for a moment and try to imagine how the above technological developments will impact on ordinary people's lives. Pretty soon, it will be possible to buy artificially brained robots that perform useful tasks around the house. If the price of such robots can be made affordable, then the demand for them will be huge. I believe in time that the world economy will be based upon brain-based computers. Such devices will be so useful and so popular that everyone on the planet will want to own them. As the technologies and the economics improve, the global market for such devices will only increase to the point that most of the planet's politics will be tied up in supporting it. Not only will the commercial sector be heavily involved in the production of ever smarter and ever more useful robots and artificial brain-based devices, but so too, of course, will the military forces of the world. It is unlikely in the next few decades that the planet will have formed a, tr a truly global state with a global police force to defend its global laws. Instead, I believe there will be a growing political rivalry over the next half century between the United States and China to be the world's most powerful nation. This rivalry will ensure that the ministers of defense of both countries cannot afford to allow the other country to develop more intelligent soldier robots and other artificial brain-based defense systems than their own. Hence, national governments will be heavily involved in pushing the development of military-based artificial brain research and will only spill over in time to the commercial sector as has been the pattern for over a century. Thus the rise of artificial brain-based robotics and related fields seems unstoppable. There will be so much military and commercial momentum behind it that it's difficult to imagine how it could be stopped unless somehow a mass political movement is formed to block its development. How might such a movement get off the ground? It's not too difficult to imagine what might happen. Imagine a few decades from now that millions of people have already bought household cleaning robots, sex robots, teaching machines, babysitter robots, companionship robots, friendship robots, etc. And that these brain-based machines talk quite well and understand human speech to a reasonable extent. A few years later, what happens? Not surprisingly, the models of that earlier year are now seen by their owners to be rather old-fashioned and not as attractive as the latest models. The latest models will be more intelligent because their speech is of higher quality. They will understand more and give better, more appropriate answers. Their behavioral repertoire will be richer. In short, they will make the earlier models look quite inferior. So what does everyone do? Of course, they will scrap their old robots and buy new ones and have their old ones updated with better artificial neural circuitry. In a further few years, the same process will repeat itself in a fashion similar to the way buyers of personal computers behaved in the 1980s and 1990s, etc. 
However, some of the more reflective buyers may start noticing that their household machines and robots are becoming smarter and smarter in every machine generation so that the IQ gap between human beings and robots keeps getting smaller. Once the robots start getting really quite smart, suddenly millions of robot owners will start asking themselves some awkward questions. Just how smart could these artificially brained robots become? Could they become as smart as human beings? If that's possible, is that a good thing? Might not the robots then be smart enough to be a threat to humanity? Could the robots become smarter than humans? If so, how much smarter? Should humanity allow these robots to become smarter than human beings? If they become a lot smarter than human beings, might they decide that humans are a pest, a cancer on the surface of the planet, and decide to wipe us out? Should humanity take the risk that that might happen? Should a limit be placed on the robot's AIQ, that's Artificial Intelligence Quotient, so that the robots are smart enough to be useful to human beings, but not too smart so as to be threatening? Will it be possible to stop the rise of robot AIQ? Will it be politically, militarily, economically possible to stop the robots becoming smarter every year? There are lots of people who see the creation of massively intelligent machines as the destiny of the human species. These people will not like any limits being placed on AIQ levels. Won't this create conflict amongst human beings? You may be able to think of other such questions relating to the rise of artificial intelligence and the creation of artificial brains with ever greater capabilities. How do I see humanity facing up to the challenge of the rise of smart machines? My personal scenario that I find the most plausible I will present to you now. However, before doing so, I would like to introduce a new term that I will use from now on throughout this book as it is a useful shorthand for the term godlike massively intelligent machine. The new term is Artelect, which is a shortened version of artificial intellect. The term artelect features in the very title of this book, The Artelect War. So it's probably the most important concept and term in this book. I believe that the 21st century will be dominated by the question as to whether humanity should or should not build artelects that is, machines of godlike intelligence, trillions of trillions of times above the human level. I see humanity splitting into two major political groups, which in time will become increasingly bitterly opposed as the Artelic issue becomes more real and less science fiction-like. The human group in favor of building Artelics I label the Cosmists, based on the word cosmos, the universe, which reflects their perspective on the question. To the cosmists, building artelects will be like a religion, the destiny of the human species, something truly magnificent and worthy of worship, something to dedicate one's life and energy to help achieve. To the cosmists, not building the artelects, not creating the next higher form of evolution, thus freezing the state of evolution at the puny human level, would be a cosmic tragedy. The cosmos will be bitterly opposed to any attempt to stop the rise of the 21st century artelect. The second human group opposed to the building of artelects I label the Terrans, that's T-E-R-R-A-N-S, based on the word Terra, the Earth, which reflects their inward-looking, non-cosmic perspective. The Terrans, I strongly suspect, will argue that allowing the cosmos to build their artelects in a highly advanced form implies accepting the risk that one day the Artelex might decide, for whatever reason, that the human species is a pest. Since the Artelex will be so vastly superior to human beings in intelligence, it would be easy for the Artelex to exterminate the human species if they so decided. But you may argue that if the Artelex truly become very smart, they would realize that human beings gave birth to them, that we are their parents. Therefore, the Artelex would respect us and treat us well. This may be what happens, but the point is, I argue, that you could not be certain that the Artelex would treat humanity with the level of respect that we would like. 
Don't forget, the Arteleks have the potential of becoming trillions of trillions of times smarter than we are. So there's always the possibility that they could become so smart that human beings would appear to them to be so inferior that we would simply not be worth worrying about. Whether humanity survives or not might be a matter of supreme indifference to them. It's not exaggerating to say that there's quite a close analogy between an Arteleck trying to communicate with a human being and a human being trying to communicate with a rock. To make another analogy, consider your feelings towards a mosquito as it lands on the skin of your forearm. When you swat it, do you stop to consider that the creature you just killed is a miracle of nanotechnological engineering that scientists of the 20th century had absolutely no way of building? The mosquito consists of billions of cells, each of which can be looked upon as a kind of molecular city, where a molecule in a cell is equivalent to a person in a city. The comparative scale of molecule to cell is about the same as person to city. Despite the fact that the mosquitoes, which took billions of years to evolve, are extremely complex and miraculous creatures, we human beings don't give a damn about them and swat them because from our perspective they are a pest. We have similar attitudes towards killing ants when we walk on them during a stroll through the forest or when flushing spiders down the plug hole. Who is to say that the Arteleks might not have similar attitudes towards human beings and then wipe us out? With their gargantuan intellectual intelligence, it would be as easy as pie for them to do so. The critical word in the Arteleck debate for the Terrans is risk. The Terrans will argue that humanity should never take the risk that the Arteleks in an advanced form might decide to wipe out the human species. The only certain way that the risk remains zero is that the Arteleks are never built in the first place. When push comes to shove, if the Terrans see that the cosmos are truly serious about building Arteleks in an, ad, in an advanced state, then to preserve the survival of the human species, the Terrans will exterminate the cosmists. Killing a few million cosmists will be considered justifiable by the Terrans for the sake of preserving the survival of the whole human species, that is, billions of people. Such a sacrifice would be deemed reasonable by the Terrans. To make a historical analogy, when Stalin's troops were pushing west at the end of World War II to capture Berlin and destroy Hitler's Nazi regime that murdered 20 million Russians, they were losing about 100,000 Russian soldiers killed or injured for every major East European city captured from the Nazis. To Stalin, such a sacrifice was considered justifiable for the greater good of ridding the Russian people of the horror of mass murdering Nazism. You may now ask, would anyone in their right mind genuinely choose, when push comes to shove, to be a cosmist and truly risk the annihilation of the human species?